missing for a long time. It's a little spotty now on the inside. So, once upon a time there's this little game called D&D. &D. I played it a, a handful of times with people and honestly my first experience with it was absolutely terrible. It was after I got done with the final performance in a play and a bunch of people were like, well we all role play spent four hours building characters to have us kill one another accidentally. It's like that was the worst plan ever. That's not the story we're telling today, though. The story we're telling today is how I made DMing awesome. And it's arguable if I actually did do that. But I decided, oh, I'll get a group of friends together. I'll actually be the DM here. So I got a, a, a DM Kassir, um, my friend uh, Jared, his girlfriend Tara, and I believe, Cra yeah, Craig, way back when. That, that sounds right. And I decided, yeah, you're all going to build exactly the characters that you want, and we're going to run this story in this tiny little town, and then the adjacent mountain town next to it. So one was a port, and one was a dwarven in the mountain city. And I was thinking, all right, this is going to be nice and easy, nice and straightforward. Did I mention sometimes I like to fly, play a little fast and loose with the rules? I don't know who I could have ever learned that from. No, not, no idea, but it turned out to make a very memorable, thank you, thank you, appreciate you flipping me off there, it made a very memorable occasion, because I, I still talk about parts of this campaign to this day, so it means I haven't gotten any no, more new stories, or the events were that bizarre. But at the very beginning, this level one ranger had a companion. I allowed it, and I'm like, oh, that's cool enough first battle it got into, this companion got killed. And so I was just like, okay, I'm the worst DM ever. I'm so sorry. I give you the world just to take it away. And so she was a little bitter about that, but she still made her way to the port town. I wanted them all to meet in the town and come together naturally. This was going to be just a very organic character, a party creation. I wasn't gonna force their hand. This somehow worked. It shouldn't have, especially with, uh, Jordan. <clears throat> uh, there was one character who was being played by Jordan, a role player which we reference once in a while on uh, this show and in the opening DM bits. And he had a great plan. He was going to park his ship a la Jack Sparrow. Complete with, hey, you know, let's just go ahead and put it at the dock here and some of it's sticking out. Well, okay. You're gonna go ahead and pay your way in into parking your boat there. And he says, well, I'm not going to pay anything. So the Doc Master's like, uh, actually, you are going to pay for that. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just going to walk away. The guards are called. And at the point where I realized, hey, he's hiding underneath the docks at the pier. And all of these guards are trying to get underneath the pier and attack him. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, let's reverse time a little bit. Jordan, roll your character's intelligence. To anyone who's actually DM'd anything before, you know that's not what that status for. You roll for the intelligence modifier. But I'm like, no, 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 let's go ahead and take your intelligence here and just roll a d20 here. Yeah, you're, you, you rolled an 18. You pay the man! Hey, well there you go! That intelligence roll is pretty much the only reason that his character worked. Every time he would go out of his way to try and do something to totally defeat the whole point of doing this adventure. I would say, are you going to roll intelligence? <laughs> yeah, looking back, I was cheating as a DM. They, they, I should have let him make the poor choice. I should have let him die, but I wanted this thing to get off the ground. So they get together in this port town, and uh, the, the other ones, I mean, they had some interesting uh, stories of getting together, but none of them just stuck in my mind. So I'm thinking it was usual party stuff. They get the quest of, hey, there is this item, there's this item that is being held in the bowels of this mountain, and basically the Underdark, close to that, is where it was going to be at. Something was in there. Something that none of the characters really knew about, except for the drow. The male drow. Which, uh, <laughs> if anyone knows anything about drow culture, from D&D. &D. Um, he was, he, as he put it himself, dressed in a dirty, ripped gunny sack 
with not food written on it. Because that's how males were valued in that society. So, he had an idea of what was down there. He didn't want to go down there. But he was also one who knew more about the Underdark and things related to that than anyone else in the party, so it made sense for him to be there. So, they get this quest and they move out of the port town and go into the mountains. Here's where things started to get weird. These dwarves were a little bit isolated from normal society. The way that I envisioned it is, you're in the mountains. You don't really have, like, really good burial areas. It's just rock, and you're always mining out the rock. So after these battles, where obviously people are dying, and what do you, what do, you do with the bodies? I came up with the creative solution. <laughs> the Red Torch District. See... While it may be taboo in human society and main society, necrophilia was completely not a, a thing to even blink an eye at for these uh, dwarves. And so that's what happened with the uh, people who fell in combat, is they were taxidermied and um, utilized. One of the first encounters they had, and this was something that I was really excited for, I'm thinking, this is a bunch of, uh, they've had a couple encounters getting up to the mountain town, I'm thinking, they're ready for this. They're ready for this one big, like, almost sub-boss. And so, as they're getting closer to this mountain town, this creature burrows up from underneath them, out of the solid rock. This delver with the acid claws and the, it's just like a living mountain, and it just consumes, and it's like it's it's got, you know, so much destructive potential. So, the ranger hears, oh, this creature burrows up? Well, I tried to make it my animal companion since I lost mine. And I'm thinking, Pfft. you know what? Let's, let's roll it and see what happens. Natural 20. Because I love the fact that uh, natural 20s are so powerful, I go ahead and say, hey, natural 20, you have... An animal companion of a Delver. In a campaign that takes place mostly in a mountain town. They officially had a cheat code along for the ride. God, that Delver made everything so broken. I had plans of how I was going to lay out all these dungeons for them to kind of go between the cave systems. That flew out the window once they got that Delver in the party. It was, okay, we know it's generally in this direction. Dig! <laughs> And it, it followed, and yeah. I ruined my own campaign because the natural 20 was that cool. By the time that they got into town, they had the ability to basically run the entire campaign without having to worry about trying to find locations. So the biggest challenge then became the enemies they came across. And that's when I decided, you know what? Let's go ahead, since they're starting to gain some level, gain some prowess, let's go ahead and challenge them with two Hellcats. That sounds like it's a decent enough challenge. Oh my god. I almost caused my first party wipe. That was... that was a little too much. You know when you you think your players got a handle on every situation you throw at them, and so you go, ah, hey, let's go ahead up the ante by three clicks. And then suddenly they're all staring at you, what did you do that for? I'm like, I, I don't know, it's my first time doing this. Uh, they all survived. But one did go into down status. They were so wiped after that, they went back to the inn. Notice how I said one was downed, as in unconscious. That became its own horror story unto itself. Because that character happened to be, uh, Jordan's character. So, all about second chances. I say to, okay, the rest of you, you wake up feeling refreshed at the inn. Jordan, you wake up in a dark, dark room. Like, no light. And all you feel around you is stiff flesh. So, because he was downed and his breathing was shallow, when they picked up the bodies after the battle, they thought he was dead and threw him in with the bin. The bin, which is also sealed, you know, because you don't want that smell leaking out before you get a chance to taxidermy them. And in the course of trying to escape, he almost went down again. Yes, yeah, so the first time he went down but stabilized. 
This time, if he went down, he was going to die. And he knew exactly what was going to happen to him if he died there. He, he was not only fighting for his life, he was fighting for his character's dignity. It was kind of a great struggle, and he did eventually break out of there and just leave the campaign. He was just, his character was done, and I'm like, that, that is the best role-playing choice you've ever made, Jordan. That, that is exactly what a person in your shoes would actually do. You, you don't want to risk getting into that box again. During the course of going through this town, preparing supplies for going deeper into the mountain, they come across this, uh, this magic shop, which has on the back wall all the scrolls of healing you could ever want. And they're on sale. They are on sale for an amazing price. All the healing scrolls you want is basically... What money do you think you could... Okay, that amount, sure. I'll take that amount for all the healing scrolls. I think it was 200 scrolls of Cure Minor Wounds. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, 3.5, um, Cure Minor Wounds heals one hit point. So, you have scrolls. Outside of combat, that's great, but that's going to do you absolutely no good in combat. And even so, you just are carrying around 200 scrolls, essentially, for 200 hit points worth of healing. Remember that. It's going to become very important later. And that's what I loved about this campaign. All this ridiculous little crap along the route actually panned out. It became important. Another item they found in the magic shop was cream cheese. Wasn't that the bagel shop? Not the magic shop? We had a bagel shop, that's right. Yeah. So, at the bagel shop there was this cream cheese. <laughs> You'll understand why I thought it was the magic shop once you hear what this cream cheese did. You know how there's this thing called, um, of random enchantment that you can add on to any... That's basically, it was the cream cheese of random enchantment. But it wasn't an official thing at all. It was, I had on a list, on paper, 1 through 20, 20 different effects that when you had this cream cheese, it would take effect. I believe 20 was healed to full, or even something better than that, like a, a stat boost or something. But, if you got a 1, you immediately turn to stone. Like, completely. So, yeah. It was a cream cheese of random enchantment. Uh, Craig's character had poison gloves. But there's a double-edged sword to that, because it wasn't just when he wanted it to poison things. It was poisons whatever he touches, gloves. Thank God, I've, he fought with his hands. I think he was a monk. And, yeah, so his, his favorite thing was someone would reach in like, Oh, nice to meet you. Oh, did it! Because <laughs> he was afraid he was actually going to kill someone with his poison. Like right there, he would have poisoned his own brain with that kind of move. It was a terrible existence. Why didn't he just take those gloves off? I probably cursed them. You did. That's just the kind of guy I am. <laughs> but it did poison, literally. He could turn any projectile. Like, he could pick up a stone and throw it, and it would strike with poison damage. That's a pretty cool effect, honestly. Constant poisoning of anything he touches made eating really hard. So, they get all their uh, stuff together. And they decide that they're going to start digging down into the, the thing that's causing all this evil to happen within this town. Throughout this, Tom's character keeps reminiscing about his ex-wife, I believe? No, still, still wife. His current wife, who he escaped <laughs> the Underdark um, to, to get away from. Because he was a male in drow society. This wasn't something that you took lightly. Trying to get out of the Underdark basically meant you strike out that not part on the not food if they got you again. So, we find this lich. Guess who the lich turns out to be? His wife. Talk about a conflicting allegiance suddenly. Um, we have the battle ensue. And he's figured out a way. He, find, he was like, utilizing everything he could in his role-playing arsenal. 
figured out the way to try and help his wife in a way that ultimately would hurt her. He grabbed the bag full of cure minor wounds, and after she got her first initial hit, he tried to heal her with cure minor wounds every single turn. She's a lich, so that means he was doing constant one damage every turn. Needling away! But in character, he's like, I'm just trying to help here, I'm just trying to help. So he was... Yeah. It was weird. But that's just the kind of campaign this was. They defeat the lich, they're moving on to the next town. Yes, they were ele like escalator lifted out of the mountain on these magical enchanted stone escalator things. Weirder things have happened. <laughs> they have. They very much have. In fact, they did shortly after this because that's when they went into the forest and ran into what I like to call the party reset. Belio the Bard. Because they got such great magical items and so many overpowered things, I was like, this campaign cannot continue. With uh, It's not going to be a challenge. They're going to be able to just wipe the floor with anything I throw at them at this point, because they can take out way higher level stuff. I need to nerf them other things, but make it a natural event. I randomly generated all of Belio. Even the name Belio was a result of me rolling percentile dice and going by an alphabetical chart. So, the only stat that was not randomly generated for Belio was her charisma. She had below average strength, below average dex, and moderate intelligence. Intelligent enough, everything was suck. But her charisma score was an 85. For those of you playing at home, a 20, a charisma score of 20 means you have a plus 5 modifier to any charisma based skill, which is diplomacy, attraction, all of that. At 85? She could just take a 20 on most social encounters. She was beautiful beyond words, and when they walked into her camp, she said, Hey, guys, I just was uh, wandering through the woods. I happened to, my caravan got looted, and so could you give me all of your stuff? And guess what? They were going to. Except for the drow. The drow... Belial was an elf. The drow have notoriously hated elves longer than they've been alive. And so he asked, can I make a will to resist the request from her? I remember it well because you were like, oh, yeah, you resisted this time, but next time, oh, you're not going to resist. He's like, all right, well, guess what? You didn't, fit, you, you didn't get it the second time, so now you gotta start giving up your stuff. Alright, alright, I remember this well. Because I had the bagel. I said, hey, do you want a bagel? She's like, oh, sure, I'll take a bagel. <laughs> and what is the one thing he does with his one free action before Belio completely just takes over the situation and takes all of his stuff? Cream cheese! He, once again, thought of the items that we had in, in play and utilize them, Beale's like, oh yeah, this looks great. Takes, bites, roll a one. Beale turned into stone. And so, what does another overachieving party member do? He realizes, hey, she's stone. That beautiful charisma is still there. It's still a very beautiful statue. He finds a way to shrink it down and carries it along with him. And so there became this mythical item called the Belio statue. The owner was immune to its effects, but anyone who gazed upon it could not take their eyes off of it and was immediately entranced with it. You want to know how many situations he got out of with that down the road? The one thing that I did, like, okay, I've screwed up a lot in this, I've overpowered my players, I've given them free reign, and they are just running amok. This is bulletproof. This will take them, this will take them back down to where they should be. Completely backfired. We didn't run too many more sessions of that one, mostly because we all started to, that was a point when uh, 
we're all going off to college and going our separate ways a bit, but I will never forget that little mountain town, the Red Torch District, and the Belio statue. I was the DM at that point, and seriously, you need to find that rag again. This thing is disgusting. I mean, if I had one right now, I would clean it for you. This is, this is awful. <laughs> Jesus. You drink out of this? Every day. God. Sometimes twice. A spit shine or something.